paradox was developed in limited paragraphs and attended by an outline of how it would be exposed and explored and uh, renewed in, in, a, in a, a reading of the Brothers Karamazza. Um, an exemplary way. But this kind of beginning poses a particular kind of challenge for a student because as students, readers, writers, our job isn't just to clearly express an idea clearly and truly, but actually to recover that idea as an experience and a reality breaking over. And uh, in the course of writing this thesis, working through the Brothers Karamazov in ways that disturbed her and challenged her and um, she really did um, recover that idea. So, you know, I recommend you to uh, ask her for a copy of her writing thesis as well. Wow, uh, well, no that would be wonderful. Well, be wonderful for you. and such an excitement to have you all here today. First, I would like to thank Professor Cooper. Uh, the outline that I initially proposed changed quite a bit throughout the semester uh, and the previous one, and he's been very patient with all my last minute editing and <laughs> all the changes I've made. So thank you very much for working with me. I'd like to thank Professor Hill for being my second reader and second panelist, and Professor Washett for being my third panelist today. <laughs> Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, high and holy, meek and lowly, thou hast brought me to the valley of vision, where I live in the depths, but see thee in the heights. Hemmed in by mountains of sin, I behold thy glory. Let me learn by paradox that the way down is the way up, that to be low is to be high, that the broken heart is the healed heart, that the contrite spirit is a rejoicing spirit, that the repenting soul is the victorious soul, that to have nothing is to possess all, that to bear the cross is to wear the crown, that to give is to receive, that the valley is the place of vision. Lord, in the daytime stars can be seen from deepest wells. In the deeper the wells, the brighter thy stars shine. Let me find thy light in my darkness, thy life in my death, thy joy in my sorrow, thy grace in my sin, thy riches in my poverty, thy glory in my valley. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can there be beauty in Sodom? Believe me, for the vast majority of people, that's just where beauty lies. Did you know that secret? The terrible thing is that beauty is not only fearful, but also mysterious. Here, the devil is struggling with God, and the battlefield is the human heart. In the ultimate language of Dmitry Karamazov, a desperate and base man, Fyodor Dostoevsky frames the human heart's most essential sequence of questions. What is beautiful? How do I know beauty? And how do I respond to a broken world? I say that these three questions are the essential questions of human life because they encapsulate within them the entire longing of the fallen human heart to see the face of God. They encompass the mysteries of the incarnation, God's love for the material world, and the impact of these on human life. Indeed, it is a mysterious and tragic reality that even after the cross, death, and resurrection of Christ, men still die. If Christ came to heal every wound, why? do we all still bear scars? If he came to destroy death, why do we all still die? The answer to these questions is absolutely essential for our life, both earthly and divine. If we cannot answer them, we cannot know who we are and who God is. Truly, Christ is the only complete answer to these questions because his glorified body, as it stands in heaven, is still wounded. It is these unhealed but holy wounds of Christ that we must enter to discover the answer to our crisis of beauty. 
So as my pathway into these wounds of Christ, I chose Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov. Indeed, Dostoevsky knows the ugliness of the world. He writes images full of sordid longings, horrible alterations, and man's inclinations towards destruction. And yet, it seemed to me that his characters came to conversion and redemption, not simply in spite of the ugliness of the world, but actually through it, experiencing it as it is in God. I, in my thesis, spent a great deal of time close reading the life of Alyosha and his story of conversion. However, I realized very early on in composing this oration that close reading is a format much more suited to the written word than the spoken. And so this oration will not primarily be on Alyosha and his life, but on the impact, the philosophical, theological, and moral or artistic impact of the way that he lived his life. <clears throat> Through his conversion and experience of Christ, he came to what I will call the iconographic vision, which is, I propose, the correct way for man to move through a broken world with Christ. I propose this, that beauty, insofar as it is active and manifest to those of us who live in a post-lapsarian and post-incarnational world, is ultimately inclusive of that which we call ugly. This kind of beauty allows access to the heart of God through the fallen nature of man, not in spite of it. Redemption is accomplished on, not around, the unlovely cross. So in order to accomplish the end of this oration, I've broken it into several parts. First, we will walk through our three essential questions with the help of the authors Jacques Maritain, William F. Lynch, and Flannery O'Connor. Then I will turn to examining the nature of icon and the incarnation, and the relation of these to literature and the grotesque mode. Finally, I will end with an explanation of why this crisis of the beautiful but ugly affects all of us, even if we are not writers of fiction. So let's turn to our first question. What is beautiful? Indeed, this is perhaps the most difficult and most elusive of our three questions. There have been literal wars fought over this question for the entirety of human history. Rightly so, I suppose, if we're talking about cosmic battlefields. In my own study of this subject, I've been continually puzzled by the reality of the ugly of the yet loved objects which we encounter. It's hard to say ugly or lovely in exclusion of the other. It's hard to name them. At this point, I would like to turn on her knees, his mother, sobbing as if in hysterics, with shrieks and cries, seizing him in her arms, hugging him so tightly that it hurt, and pleading for him to the mother of God, holding him out from her embrace with both arms towards the icon, as if under the protection of the mother of God. Alyosha remembered his mother's face, too, at that moment. He used to say that it was frenzied but beautiful, unquote. How can this be? How can Alyosha possibly look at the distorted, ravaged, suffering face of his mother and call it beautiful? This is the ugly yet lovely object. So enter Jacques Maritain, who will help us to name and illuminate this ugly yet lovely paradox. So in order to unite ugliness and loveliness, Maritain first has to, of course, like any good philosopher, set some definitions. He has to define beauty and its boundaries. An orthodox Thomist, Maritain agrees with Aquinas' definition of beauty as that which pleases when seen, and that which has the three properties of beauty, integrity, proportion, and radiance, in a complete or perfect way. Integrity refers to the unity or wholeness of the thing, proportion to the balance or ratio between its aspects, and radiance to the mysterious clarity with which its, its essence becomes apparent. So the first kind of beauty that distinguishes is transcendental beauty. This is the beauty that, quote, belongs in the realm of the transcendentals, being as undivided, being as confronting the power of knowledge, being as confronting the power of desire. Beauty 
is the radiance of all transcendentals united, unquote. Now, it is important to note that this transcendent is not directly apparent to us. It is beyond our senses. It's immaterial. It is connected with pure being. It is to see reality from its angle is to see it through the lens of God, who perceives things through the lens of his own pure being. Mariton says that, quote, just as everything is in its own way and is good in its own way, so everything is beautiful in its own way, unquote. So with this definition of transcendental beauty in mind, Mariton can move on to distinguish a second type of beauty, the aesthetic beauty. And it's very important to note that it's only at this level of beauty is ugliness actually possible. Aesthetic beauty is the beauty which pertains to our senses. It's that which we can perceive, feel, touch, taste, and so forth. It's the realm of the material, which is different from pure being, which is itself the material. And ugliness cannot exist in transcendental beauty because as pure being, it has no matter, no principle of change or corruption. And so these three properties of beauty always exist in completion in the transcendental realm. So then, if aesthetic beauty is that which pleases when seen, and that which materially has the three properties of beauty, aesthetic ugliness is that which displeases when seen, which means that it has the three properties of beauty in some partial or incomplete way, some kind of defect. Now, when we experience aesthetic ugliness, we, it causes this, this paradoxical feeling of the ugly and lovely in us because we perceive both the material face of the thing, the ugly matter attached to it, and the radiant transcendental beauty that comes from it simply having being. This is that experience I was talking about earlier. So Mariton brings us to these three very important truths. First, a thing is transcendentally beautiful insofar as it has being. Second, a thing is aesthetically beautiful insofar as the material has the three properties in a complete way. And third, a thing is aesthetically ugly when it material ha materially has these properties in an incomplete way. And from this, I would like to distinguish a third category of beauty. Now, this is me adding on to another time. <laughs> but it becomes apparent here that it's possible, as I said earlier, to have aesthetic ugliness in conjunction with transcendental beauty and hearing in the same subject. This is what I will call grotesque beauty. Transcendental beauty paired with aesthetic ugliness. All right, so we've answered our first question, but we have not solved the upsetting nature of the ugly yet lovely. So let's move on to the second question. How do I know beauty? How do I know it, especially when it can be veiled with such apparent ugliness? Well, it is extremely tempting in these moments of aesthetic confusion to simply dismiss the entire material world as ugly or too tainted by it to be salvaged and to locate beauty in the transcendental realm of wrong. However, to do this would be untrue to our own humanity and to the nature of beauty itself. How do I know beauty? How do I know anything? Primarily through my sense experience. I am embodied. I am a man, not an angel. And therefore, I cannot directly perceive being. I have to experience it as determined in a particular reality, or the definite. This is the argument of literary critic William F. Lynch, who says, quote, there are no shortcuts to beauty or to insight. We must go through the finite, the limited, the definite, omitting none of it, unquote. So if the definite is any sensible substance, for instance, that coat, this chair, my body, we see that all these things have being, are not pure being. They, just as aesthetic beauty is a material determination of transcendental beauty, so is the particular object a material determination of being more generally. These things are connected. Particular being takes its being from being more generally. <laughs> Love being there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it, every finite thing has within itself some kind of flavor or shade of the infinite. 
And that is what we are able to encounter when we enter deeply into the finite world. Lynch calls this way of the definite the, quote, narrow path to beauty, insight, and God, unquote. He also says that this is the most theological way for man to live, as it gives us a kind of sixth sense for spiritual reality. We can perceive every material thing with its sensible meaning as well as its insensible one. And perhaps most strangely of all, this experience with the definite doesn't just open the doors for transcendental beauty, 